up for that worship? Hello. Would you guys give it up for that worship team? That was all students, Thrive students. So cool. And while you're at it, would you give it up for every single student that is here serving in the parking lot, serving at hospitality, serving here on our worship team? Give it up for them. Yeah, this is a special and fun Sunday. You heard Brian say it. It is student takeover. We are taking over every aspect of the service. Students are serving all around. And that means that your student team, the dream team themselves, we get to be up here to teach with you this morning. I know they like that. They say they're their dream team. If you don't know us, this is Rachel Anna. She's our students pastor. Hey. Noah Reynolds. Yeah, I, oh, I got to leave room for that applause. <laughs> Noah Reynolds, our middle school pastor. There it is. And my name is Jake. I'm our high school pastor. Well, hey, sometimes you guys hear a phrase like student takeover, and it, it, it creates some images in your head, whether you were in student ministry long ago, and you have maybe some good, maybe some wild memories of what that was like. Maybe you were never a part of student ministry, and you're a little bit nervous because you've heard things like this. Dustin, show them that meme that I found where people think this, like at youth group, you get given a can of soda, and they were like, okay, drink it through a sock now. And we're, <laughs> we're not going to do that to you. We promise. You're just going to get a fun glimpse of the way our minds, we take that down. It's so distracting. There we go. You'll get a fun glimpse of how our minds work as we take you through the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter four this morning. And as I get to recap us and get us to where we're at, I just want to encourage you, if you've got a Bible, turn it to Acts chapter four. What's so fun is normally when we do this with middle schoolers, we'll say, okay, you know, Noah, today we're in Acts chapter four. Everybody turn your Bibles. And what do they do? They got to they shout it. Hey, it's on page 732, right, Piper? Piper's like, I got the page number. <laughs> I'll shout it out so everybody knows because we all use the same paper Bible over there. Y'all got different Bibles, different page numbers. But if you find Acts chapter 4, that's where we're going to be this morning as we continue through the book of Acts. And here's where we've, where we've come from. And the reason I want to recap so much is, I, is we get to see some patterns that happen throughout Acts that are going to continue today. So Acts chapter 1 starts with the original, the 11, the OG apostles, the disciples, the followers of Jesus. And Jesus gives them this instruction. He says, I've got a present for you. It's a gift. It's a surprise. You don't know what it is, but I want you to hang out in the city until you get it. And so they hang out, they wait, and then the prize, the gift, it comes. And what it is, is it's the Holy Spirit, the presence of God that would dwell in his people. Um, and, and the way it comes to the people here in this story in Acts chapter 1 is they paint this like wild picture of it, like it resting on believers like tongues of fire. It's this incredible story. And what happens when you see something wild, like tongues of fire resting on people, something I never saw, but like if I had seen that, you might be like me and you might have some questions, right? Like if you see something that you wouldn't believe, a miracle, if you will, it would lead to questions. That's the beginning of our pattern this morning. It happens all throughout Acts. There's a miracle, and so what do you do? You ask questions. And as people ask questions, then Peter gets the opportunity to then preach a sermon. He tells them everything about Jesus and who it is that's doing that miracle, and then he gives them a chance to respond. And it says in Acts chapter 1 that after that first sermon that Peter preached that 3,000 people came to believe. Well, that pattern continues. We go straight out of there in the Acts chapter 2. We get to see the picture of what the church looks like and the things that are important to them, that they're devoted to, that they're committed to. And we see uh, the way they're described. And then we get this story where Peter and John are walking. They approach the temple. And as they go to the temple, they see a man who's sitting in front of the temple. And he's out there. He's begging. He's going, can I get a little help? Can I get a couple bucks? Would someone help me? And these, these young guys, Peter and John, they walk in looking like a couple youth pastors. And the guy goes, hey, can I, can I, do you have any money to spare? And they say, no, not us. We don't have any money. I'm so sorry. But <laughs> what I have, I'll give you. And he reaches his hand out to the man. And he grabs him by the hand. And he says, in the name of Jesus, stand and walk. And that's what happens. This man who had been lame from birth, who never had the ability to walk, stands and he can walk. And again, here it is. The pattern continues. Miracle happens. Something blows away the crowd, the onlookers, the people who knew that this man could never walk. And they begin to ask questions. Miracle questions. Peter preaches a sermon. It's the sermon that uh, Brandon uh, uh, shared with us last week that Peter preaches this sermon. And he's so clear and it's so um, repetitive and sometimes it's repetitive because it's the same gospel that he's preaching, whether in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 4, or we're in 2024. He says it real simply. He says, hey, listen, the, the person who did the miracle, it's not us. There's nothing special up here. But the person who did the miracle is Jesus. And they're going, G Jesus? I know that name. He goes, yeah, you know that name because it's the Jesus who you crucified, who you sent to the cross, who died, but that God raised from the dead, and that through the power of God that you too can be saved. And so he says the, the response is that you would repent and be baptized. And as Brandon was preaching that word last week, as we're seeing that happen in Acts chapter 3, I'm afraid there's something that we missed. 
Because if, if, you, if you had seen this on a screen, like if you had seen this as an episode on Netflix, if you had seen this in a movie, what would start happening now is that that music would start to play. You know that, that tense music with the low, ominous sounds? It might sound a little bit like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> May the fourth be with you. See, you would, see, you would hear that. <laughs> you would hear that sound, and you would know that tensions were rising. And that's where we are in Acts chapter 4. If you're there, we'll read it together. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to throw it on the screens, but here's what it says. It says, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. See, these were those Darth Vader-like figures who made it all suddenly grow tense. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is resurrection of the dead. And so what did they do? They arrested them. And since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But, but. Many of the people who heard the message believed, and so the number of men who believed now totaled 5,000. We're beginning to see that pattern at play. Miracle happens. People ask questions. Peter preaches, and then people respond. I love that, that that's included right here in the text because what we see, if we miss this, is we see that the disciples are arrested. We see that the apostles who are preaching are arrested. They're stopped, and it looks like there's an end to what's happening. And what the writer is saying is that although the apostles are stopped, the power behind the word of God is not stopped that it is still at work, that because of what Peter was preaching, that, 5, 000, that the number of those who believed now totaled 5,000. And then it says, the next day, the council of all the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the religious law, they met in Jerusalem. And it names all these important people that we don't have time to go into. This Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. And they brought in the, Judas, the two disciples, and they had demands on them. They had questions <laughs> of them. But I wonder if... I wonder if we were there, if we would have picked up on some of the things that Peter and John might have been feeling in that moment. Peter and John, who had just spent the night in jail, getting a glimpse of what it might look like to have to take a stand for their faith. And they might be backing down, and they might be going, you know, you know, we said some things, and it got us in trouble, and spending the night in jail was not fun. And I think if I keep saying those things, this might go on and get even worse. I wonder if maybe I shouldn't. And I also wonder if they were, they were, they were seeing this. That as, as these rulers and these elders and these teachers of the law surrounded them, they would literally do these courts, these tribunals in a circle. They would surround the people as they questioned them if they would get glimpses of what had happened to Jesus. Then in the same way, Jesus was surrounded by the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they knew the fate that Jesus ultimately got, that he went to the cross, that he died, that, that the things that he said ultimately led to his death. And they might be wondering, I don't know if it's worth it. But I'm so glad we're here to keep reading because here's what they said. They responded like this as they demanded and they questioned them. They said, by what power, in whose name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's the key line right there, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. That's the man who you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, and Peter knew his audience. He knew he was to, who he was talking to. He knew that the scriptures that they knew that they could recall because of the way that they had studied. And so he quotes words of King David from Psalm 118. He says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. And it would be really, yeah, oh, let's go, Aisha. She heard it. She said, that's right. That's a, word to, that's a word to amen. Like there's no other name, and that's what we're gonna get at this morning. But, you know, we could look at a lot of things here as we look at this text. We could dig into who these characters are, what it was like, and the, some of the things that they were feeling. But as, as the three of us sat down and we studied this passage, as we read it together, we knew that there was one question that we were each asking, that it just begged one question that, that each of us was wondering, how do I get an opportunity like Peter? And I know you're sitting out there and you're going, I don't want an opportunity like Peter. I don't want to stand in front of 3,000 people and preach. I know nobody loves doing those things. But I think what you're really asking is, how do I get an opportunity to share my faith with the people that I love? Like, I bet you if you're sitting out there, anytime you've heard a message like this, you've probably had a name that comes to your mind. Man, whether, it, whether it's your kids, whether it's a friend, a family member, someone you work with, that you've just got to man, I, I think if, if they knew Jesus like I knew Jesus, their lives could look wildly different different. And we begin to ask that question, what if I had an opportunity like Peter had? But I think there's something that keeps us from that. 
There's something that keeps us from because we read a story like this and we hear of the persecution that Peter faced and, uh, and, and we go, I- I'm not so sure that I'm ready for that kind of discomfort that might come with it. And just to, to, bring, it, to bring it in and make it real for you guys, when I was a kid, I had heard this, this message of persecution that as a, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, as a believer that I'd be persecuted. And I was like, I heard that and I took it very seriously, but I took it so seriously that when I would be out in the wild, when I'd be out walking around <laughs> my neighborhood, when I'd be out hiking because I was a Boy Scout, I'd come across a sign like this and it said, no trespassing, violators will be prosecuted. And every time I saw that sign, I saw the word prosecuted and I thought it was persecuted and I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> so I would not step onto your property. It terrified me. But just like the word prosecuted and persecuted are different, the word persecuted is different from the opposition that you and I face. And so I, I just wonder, does, does, that, does that threat of opposition keep us from really wanting that opportunity to share our faith. And so as I take a step back here and I leave us with that question, I want to sit down and turn things over to Rachel and just go, Rachel, how did Peter do it? Yeah, let's dive in. Thanks, Jake. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to take a deeper dive in the text here in a second. But you see, I want to point out that I think we, we feel a lot of the same feelings that, that Peter and John must have been feeling when they were sharing their faith. They were just a few days in uh, to doing what they were supposed to be doing, to sharing the gospel, the, the mission that God called them to. And, and we're 2,000 years in, and we're still asking the same question. How do I invite people to want a relationship with Jesus? How, how do I live my life in such a way that people become curious and I can invite them to know more? And that's exactly what we're discovering today. What can we learn from these early church leaders that impacts our faith and our walk with Jesus today? And although our worlds are different, our feelings are the same and our goal is the same. And so in verse one and two, Peter are, and John are confronted by these religious leaders and, uh, and they're arrested. They're thrown in jail and they're there all night and then in the morning they're facing trial. And there's a few reasons why I think Peter and John are confronted by these leaders. But uh, for the sake of time, we're only just gonna dive into one today. And this is the first point today, if you're taking notes, and they were confronted because they saw the good. That's point number one, they saw the good. Something good was happening through Peter and John, that it was attracting people to them, attracting people to ask more questions and to know more. And although it was like actually bothering these religious leaders and they weren't so happy that good things were happening, the good still attracted them. It was something so powerful, so good, that it attractive, that it was causing people to want to give their lives to something greater. So they saw the good, and then seeing the good led to something else. And that's our second point today. They saw the good and it led to them asking questions. That's point number two, they asked questions. The next morning, they're standing in front of this council. They're standing in front of the Supreme Court. And in verse seven, it says that they were brought in, the two disciples, and they were demand- and de- it was demanded to them, by what power or in whose name have you done this? I imagine that the whole night before they're planning, what are we going to say to these guys? What are we going to say to these big dogs in front of us as we're trying to get our way out of this situation and not spend the rest of our lives in prison? They're planning their defense, but how do they actually respond? In verse 8, it says this. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Peter is looking at these uh, leaders in the Jewish faith, these guys that are supposed to be leading the charge, and he looks at them and he says that you are the leaders of this faith, but you reject the one that you serve. You rejected your God. And then Peter goes on in verse 12 to finish this way. It says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And that person is Jesus. And as we take a look back at the entire trial, Peter and John, they don't try to defend themselves. They don't try to get their way out of it and dance around the issue but they face them head on and they point them directly to Jesus. And that's point number three today. Point number three, we point them to Jesus, that people will see the good, that they'll ask questions and we point them to Jesus. But why does this matter to us today? Why do we as the church in 2024 look back 2,000 years later at what's happening in these early days of the church? How does this affect us today? 
um, in 2020, which you never know what someone's going to say when they say in 2020, so I promise it's not going to get weird. Um, in 2020, I worked for Whole Foods, specifically in the bakery department, um, and I got to tell you, I miss my Whole Foods discount every day. Amazon Prime deals do not compare. That 30% off came in clutch all the time. Um, but I worked there for about a year, and let me tell you, working for a grocery store during the pandemic was, as you could probably expect, wild. I didn't really know what to expect walking into it as I was starting like pretty much right as the pandemic started. And um, I, the thing that surprised me most was that people were mad all the time. Everybody was mad. People were mad that they were waiting in line to get into a grocery store. They were mad because they could only purchase so much of certain items. And then employees were mad because people were just rude and unkind to them all of the time. And I mean, I get it. It was a sucky time. Everyone was mad. Everyone was going through it in their own different way. Um, but one day I'm walking out of our backstock area, just took a sip of my coffee, getting ready to start my shift. And um, I see one of my coworkers, Sarah, and I say, hey, Sarah, how you doing? And the first thing she says to me is she turns and she goes, why are you so positive and happy all the time? It's like, valid question. I get it. But I was, I was taken back by her answer, by her question. And I felt like, I was like, okay, is this a moment for me to share my faith? Is this an opportunity for me to share my faith? But do you want to know the words that came out of my mouth? I said, a whole lot of coffee. <laughs> and then I paused. And I was like, oh, wait. And then I shrunk back. And I added on, and Jesus, in a very quiet voice. And she said, okay. And I said, okay. <laughs> and we just moved on with our day and the rest of our shift. And I, can I tell you, I kick myself for my response. I look back at that moment, and I basically said, I'm so positive because I drink a lot of coffee. And if we're honest, it partly is. <laughs> if we're truthful. But I, I get down on myself for the way I responded sometimes because when I look back at that conversation, my answer wasn't an invitation for her to ask more questions about my faith. It wasn't an invitation for her to want to know more. I just tagged it on and Jesus like it was nothing. And I wish I would have said, I am the way that I am because of a relationship with Jesus. And if you ever want to know more, I'd love to tell you. Because if we're honest, if we take a look at ourselves, I know that I know who I am without Jesus. I don't like that Rachel all the time. Coffee is not enough to make the Rachel without Jesus kind and loving. It's, it's not enough. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus and how he works in me that it's possible for me to hold myself back when a customer's yelling at me for not being able to buy more than two loaves of bread. And just like Peter and John, I wonder what would happen if people saw the good in us, Bayside Folsom, the good in our character, the good in how we live out our lives, and I wonder if they would ask questions. I wonder that as we're sitting here today thinking about the opportunity of sharing our faith, Jake said at the beginning of our message that, that we all have the name of someone that comes to mind when we think about sharing our faith. It's a friend, it's a family member, it's a coworker, it's a neighbor. I know you have a name and I have a name. And, and I think we get so nervous to bring up our faith in Jesus sometimes because we're afraid of, of pushing them away or, or we're afraid of, of them thinking that we're weird for having, having this faith. And so, so often we're just waiting for them to ask. But I wonder what would happen if we lived our lives in such a way that it was an invitation for them to ask the questions, that if they would be so curious as to why we live our lives the way that we do. And as you guys have seen, as we've talked about, it's Chosen Sunday. And today, a lot of you are going to go out into the lobby after service, and whether it's you or you and your spouse or you and your family, you're going to go take a picture, and that picture is going to be taken to another country on the other side of the world, and kids are going to get to pick you. You're going to get to be chosen to uh, be this child's uh, sponsor family, and that's huge. That's an incredible way of God moving the kingdom forward, that we're creating opportunities for kids to come to know Christ because of this sponsorship program. And in a couple weeks, you're going to get that picture back, and you're going to go home, and you're going to put it on your fridge. I don't care if you don't like putting stuff on your fridge. You're putting it on your fridge so that when people come over, when that family member, when that friend, when that neighbor, when that coworker comes over to your house, they're going to look at that picture on the fridge. And I wonder what would happen if they saw that picture and they asked, who is that? Because... More often, they most likely, they probably won't look like your family. 
your, your neighbor will look at that picture and they'll say, I, I know all of your crazy kids run around the neighborhood and that kid doesn't live here. Who is that? Why do you have a picture of them on your fridge? And you get to respond and say, that's our sponsor child. Her name is Nabule. She lives in uh, East Watini, which is formerly Swaziland. And, and every day we get to help provide her clothes and education, food, and her community is impacted because we just said yes to her on the other side of the world. And I don't know what your friend's follow-up question will be. I don't, I don't know if it'll even be a question, but I wonder if having a picture like Nubule on your fridge opens this door to a conversation of what your faith in Jesus looks like. I wonder if they would see the good in us the good that Jesus is doing in and through us in the world, and they would be so inclined to ask a question or be curious about our faith. Are you living your life in such a way that it invites people to ask questions, that it invites people to be curious about why you give your faith to Jesus? And before I toss it over to Noah, I just want to acknowledge that I know that every single person in here is at a different uh, place in their faith and their relationship with Jesus. And maybe a conversation like this this morning, it excites you. You're like, yeah, give me all the kids. Yeah, I'm going to go shout the name of Jesus on a street corner. Like, yes, go for it. Do it. And pray for the opportunity that God would give you those things to have the opportunity to share your faith. Or maybe you're a little bit more like me, where you're nervous to share, share your faith outside of the walls of the church. And my prayer for us is that God would use us but that he would give us the confidence to be his vessel, to be uh, someone that points straight to him, that we wouldn't be so concerned with what, what we're doing and how we look and what's going on, but that we would be more concerned with what Jesus is doing in and through us and how it has the possibility to impact the lives of others. And last thing, I don't know if you're sitting in your chair today and maybe you're still asking yourself or you're still thinking, I don't know if this Jesus guy is for me. I'm still skeptical of this whole faith thing. I don't know if I, I'm ready to jump in yet. And my encouragement, and I'm going to even go as far to say my challenge to you this morning, don't just leave Jesus in this room. Don't just think about him when you're in this room and go about your week. But as you exit the doors and go into the lobby and you go into the parking lot and you go about your daily life, my encouragement and my challenge to you is look for the good. Look for the good happening around you and then ask the question, ask it to God, is this really you? Is this really you? Open the door to a conversation with God. I get it, going up to a random stranger in public and asking, do you know the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That feels a little stranger dangery. <laughs> so for the safety of you and them, it uh, <laughs> feels a little stranger dangery. But, but honestly, open this conversation with God. Even if you feel like you're talking into oblivion and you're still questioning if he's on the other side of this conversation, still try it. Ask him. When you see something good, when you see those families taking pictures in the lobby, ask the question, is this you? Because I promise you, our God is a God that, not, that doesn't want to hide from his people. He's not trying to conceal himself away, but he's a God that wants to show you who he is because that's his heart for you. His heart is to be in relationship with you and love you and show you who he truly is. And I wonder this morning if he could be showing you. But I'm going to pass it over to Noah to wrap us up. The bottom line is this, point number four. Jesus is the only one who saves. Jesus is the only one who saves. Like Rachel was saying, we need to try our absolute best to point people towards Jesus. That's what Jesus has asked us to do as followers of him. He's asked us to do that. So we need to try our absolute best. And I don't know about you, we can try our absolute best to try and save others, right? But I don't know if you've done this before. It doesn't work. We can't save anybody. It's not up to us. Jesus is, Jesus is the only one who can save it. And we can see it very clearly here in verse 12. It's going to pop up on the screen. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only one who can save us, but hear me, that doesn't give us an excuse to get lazy. 
That doesn't give us an excuse to just sit around and be like, oh, yeah, God's going to take care of it. I'm just going to sit here and do my own thing. No, it doesn't, give us ex- it doesn't give us the excuse to get lazy. The temptation is to just sit back and say, God knows what that person needs to hear. God will speak to that person. God knows what's best. God will reach that person when I can't. While all that is, while all that is true, he's asking us to be involved. He wants us to be involved. God wants to use us whether we know how or not. God wants to use us. God wants to use us even though he doesn't have to. God wants to use us as his followers even though he doesn't have to. He can do it all on his own. We all know that he is way more capable than we are. We all know God is way more capable than we are. We all know he can save, but God still wants us to do our part. It's like the story that I heard about the drowning man. A fellow was stuck on his rooftop in a flood, and he was praying to God for help. Soon a man in a rowboat came by, and the fellow shouted to the man on the roof, Hey, jump in. I can save you. The stranded fellow shouted back, No, it's okay. I'm praying to God, and he is going to save me. So the rowboat went on. Then a speedboat came by, and the fellow on the speedboat shouted, Jump in. I can save you. To this, the stranded man said, No, thanks. I'm praying to God, and he's going to save me. I have faith. So the speedboat went on, and then a helicopter came by, and the pilot shouted, grab this rope, and I will lift you to safety. To this, the stranded man again replied, no thanks, I'm praying to God, and he is going to save me, I have faith. So the helicopter reluctantly flew away. Soon the water rose above the rooftop, and the man drowned. He went to heaven, and he finally got his chance to discuss this whole situation with God, at which point he exclaimed, I had faith in you, but you didn't save me. You let me drown. I don't understand why. To this, God replied, I sent you a rowboat and a motorboat and a helicopter. What more did you expect? (laughs) Maybe God is calling us. Maybe God is calling us to be the person rowing the boat. Maybe God is calling us to be the person who is flying the helicopter. Maybe our friends or the people we meet are asking God to save them, and he wants to use us. So he puts us in. In the helicopter, he puts us in the rowboat. And he's saying, go, you do it. You got it. I'm asking you to go do it. God might be sending us on the rowboat. God might be sending us on the speedboat. He might be sending us on the helicopter. People are praying to God for help, but maybe God wants to send us his disciples. We are his disciples. Maybe God wants to send us. Maybe he's asking us to deliver the story of Jesus to others. We have to do our job, but in the end, Jesus is the only one who is going to save. He's the only one who can save. God uses his people. God will use us who are willing. God will use us who are willing. I want to backtrack for a second to point number three, which was point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. Now here's the question, though. What does it look like to practically point people to Jesus? I can stand up here and just be like, yeah, just do that. Go point people to Jesus. I can stand up here and say that all day. But what does it practically look like to point people to Jesus? One of the most practical ways that we can point people to Jesus is by sharing our story. Every one of us has a story. But here's the thing about sharing our story. No one outside of the church uses uses language like that. I could go up and be like, Jake, do you want me to share my story with you? (laughs) <laughs> Nobody uses that kind of language. It's just a churchy phrase that you hear in church of like, oh, go tell your story to somebody. Whether you, get, whether you ever get the opportunity to share your story or talk to someone about it, here's the question I want to pose to you and the question that absolutely rocked me. Are we actually living a life that people would ask questions about? Are we actually living a life that people would ask questions about. As I was writing this portion of the message, I was so convicted. I was sitting there on my couch, and I was like, is Jesus proud of the life that I'm living? Is Jesus proud of me, of the life that I'm living? Am I living a life that reflects Jesus? I just sit there for a second on my couch and think about that. Here's the thing, that we're not living for the approval of other people in our lives. That's, that's not what I'm saying here. I'm trying to nail in the fact that if we want to point people to Jesus, sometimes they look at us first because we're right in front of them. They don't know to go to the the Bible. They don't know to go to Jesus. 
but they know we're standing right in front of them. So maybe we have an opportunity there. Next to, next to the scriptures, our story is the most powerful resource we have. The most powerful resource we have. Those who will never listen to a sermon will listen to your story. It's a fact. Here's the thing, though. Some of us are begging for the opportunity to share our faith to other people, but we're dreading the conversation because it's awkward. How many of you guys have ever gotten there when you're like, oh, I think God's telling me to share my story, and you get there and you're just like, uh. <laughs> it's happened to me. And if it hasn't happened to you, it, it will. It's kind of an awkward thing of just like, like Rachel was saying, it was kind of weird for her to share that with her friend Sarah in that moment. She was kind of like, ah, and just froze. And we do that. It's a tough situation to be in. We could be the only Christian that our friends come in contact with. We could be the only Christian our friends come in contact with. It puts a very strange feeling in my chest and in my heart. I almost put the pressure on myself in a way. And I almost just say, oh, wow. So if my friend doesn't hear about Jesus through me and isn't curious enough to go do some research and look him up or read the Bible later, they may never meet Jesus. And it's such a hard thing to put on myself and to put on yourself. And it's a scary thought. But what if we approached every conversation with the attitude of, this may be my only opportunity. How do I handle this conversation well? This may be my only opportunity. How do I handle this conversation well? I'm going to ask everybody right now to uh, please take out your Connect card uh, that's in your bulletin. Everybody grab your bulletin, please, and, and grab your Connect card. I want to do something that might be a little bit out of our comfort zone here but I think it's going to challenge us, and it's going to be a great thing. As you're getting out that Connect card, think about this. Who is the one person in your life that God has put on your heart to have a conversation about Jesus with? Who is that one person that God has put on your heart to have a conversation about Jesus with? I can think of many names right now in my head that I know that after this, I got to go home, and I got to pray, and I got to pray, and I got to pray. Would you take that one name and would you please just write it on your connect card so that we would be able to partner with you in prayer for that person? Our whole staff here at Bayside Folsom, we meet every single Tuesday. And this Tuesday, I want to be able to bring in a big stack of connect cards to our staff meeting and be like, guys, look at all the people we get to pray for. Look at all these names that we get to pray for these people. Wouldn't that be so cool? So as you're sitting there, write down the name of that one person on your list so that me, Jake, and Rachel and our whole staff, we can pray. We would love to. Here's the thing, though. If you're, if you're in the room here and you're like, no, I haven't accepted, I haven't accepted Jesus into my heart, I'm going to ask that you put your own name on that card. And here's why. I'm going to ask that you put your own name on the card so that we can pray for you as well. Because even if you're still in this place of you're like, ah, oh, no, I don't know if I quite believe that. Maybe you're a little bit skeptical. We would just love to pray for you in your future with Jesus. Pray that you meet a Christian. Pray that you meet a friend that loves Jesus so much that they will tell you about it. I'm going to pray for us, and then the ushers are going to pass the buckets and collect those cards. So would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Jesus, thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet here today. God, thank you for the names of the people that you have placed on our hearts. And Lord, I pray that we would be bold, that we would be able to be bold in what we say with our words when we have these conversations, but gentle as well. Father, please use us to tell other people of your love. Lord, we know that each one of these stories of every single person out here is unique in their own way, and we want to thank you for that. So God, take us back to that feeling when we first met you, when we were desperate for you, God. Let that fuel us to tell as many people in our communities, on our street, on our sports teams about you so that they can experience the same love and forgiveness and joy that we felt on that day when we met you, Jesus. God, I also want to pray for the person in here who is not yet a Christian. I pray that you will use one of us somebody in their life to make an impact in their life 
God, I pray that they will come in contact with someone who displays your love so well that they would desire to know you personally and they would love you every single day. God, thank you for bringing them here today. Whether they just walked in the building for the first time or with a family member, God, thank you. Thank you for bringing us all here so that we can learn more about you. And in Jesus' name we all said, amen. After you drop your connect card in the bucket with that name, would you please stand with us as we continue to worship in this next song.